Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, dear students, good day. Hope you are in good health and doing well. In this video, we are going to learn more basic principles of removable partial denture design, specifically those related to distal extension cases, class 1 and 2 Kennedy classification cases. These cases are among the most frequently encountered partially dentulous cases seeking a removable partial dentures, as bounded saddle cases tend to seek fixed partial dentures. This video will be divided into two parts. The first part will discuss Kennedy class 1, and second part we are going to discuss Kennedy class 2 cases. It is always preferable to approach the design in a systematic way. As we mentioned earlier, first this is uh, necessary to identify the areas where teeth have been lost and decide which of these are to be used for saddle and replacement of artificial teeth, starting with the outline. Here we have the outline decided and the dentulous areas to be restored determined. We have a bilateral distal extension, so the classification is clear. It's Kennedy class 1 and modified. Immediately, we are going to determine the primary abutment teeth. And uh, here, the first uh, sub primary uh, element is the uh, mucosa. The mucosa here will be, dis dis will be considered as primary abutment because it's going to participate with the uh, retention and support for the removable partial denture. Then we have the uh, primary abutments, the second premolars, uh, lower left five and lower right five. Guiding planes are located and named. They are guiding plane one and guiding plane two. These guiding planes uh, will help us to determine the most appropriate anterior posterior tilt. And this will be uh, examined uh, using the uh, surveyor. Now, generally speaking, when we have unmodified distal extension cases, we have a posterior saddle area. We tend to, f to have a, an anterior tilt. But when we have a modification elsewhere, this will uh, interfere with this selection of the anterior posterior tilt. Now, anterior tilt of the cast on the surveyor table in favor of the guiding planes 1 and 2 will expose the distal surfaces of the primary abutments, also can be called here terminal abutments. Such exposure will eliminate the undercut areas and allow us to be conservative in the preparation of the guiding planes. Another important advantage uh, for the anterior tilt selection is the uh, exposure of the lingual uh, sulcus area, the anterior part of the sulcus. This tilt will eliminate the lingual interference and undercut, which might be present and interfere with the proper lo location of the major connector. Now, as can you notice here in this slide, uh, the presence of interference can be eliminated simply by choosing an anterior tilt. Now, as we can uh, uh, notice here that the length of the guiding plane is important, we have to avoid the full length proximal plate and guiding plane preparation because this will interfere with the physiological movement of the abutment tooth and will require excessive preparation. Carl 1973, he advised the use of short guiding planes, two to three millimeters guiding planes, uh, on the distal surface of, of the primary abutment teeth, and this will have the uh, advantages of uh, conservative preparation, uh, health of the gingiva will be maintained, and uh, there will be uh, an important uh, point which is going to be discussed later, which is the stress breaking uh, effect of uh, short guiding planes when we are going to talk about the primary or the direct abutment selection. So the outline completed, we classified the case, determined the primary abutments, including the mucosa, and the number of guiding planes, and we selected the 
and here goes to your tilt accordingly. Now we are ready to move to the second stage in the systematic approach of the design, which the uh, support. How are we going to obtain support? We mentioned that we have the mucosa as primary abutment, so here we have uh, the teeth and the mucosa, the two structures available for support in the removable partial denture in our case, which is the distal extension of the teeth and the mucosa. Now, the uh, partial dentures can be classified according to the available support into tooth bone, completely tooth bone, cases of uh, bounded saddles, or completely mucosa bone, or a mixture of uh, mucosa and teeth, we call it uh, tooth tissue bone. Of course, there is a big difference between the two structures in response to loading. We have discussed this point before. The ultimate structure that receives the load is the bone. The load will be conveyed to the bone as physiological load, shear load, shear strength, through the pendental ligament, which is a specialized supporting structure, while the load conveyed to bone through mucosa is going to be uh, uh, compressive strength, which considered as pathological load. Now here's the difference in the amount of displacement upon loading between the periodontal ligament, the PDL of the tooth, and the mucosa covering the residual ridge. Now, a patient using prosthesis with uniform support, such as bounded saddle, uh, removable partial denture, here. Uh, in this case, we have uniform support, as we mentioned while discussing the bounded saddle cases. Or if the patient is using complete denture, completely uh, mucosa borne, in both cases, we have a uniform support. And in both cases, we can fabricate a reasonably comfortable prosthesis because we have uniform support, even distribution of uh, load and occlusal forces. The problem is when we have a removable partial denture which is both a mucosa born and tooth born. It is when we have this dual source of support for the same prosthesis, tuples starts. As I mentioned earlier, that the mucosa covering the edentulous area is to be considered as primary abutment, and we are going to place a primary supporting element consequently on top of it. What is the primary supporting element we can place on mucosa? It is the saddle. And we are going to discuss the design of the saddle in the same way we are discussing the design of the wrist. So here we have the mucosa, primary supporting element. Then we have the uh, second premolar, a tooth, and here we have the second premolar and the mucosa. They are all considered primary supporting elements. So mucosa and teeth that supporting the uh, removable partial denture will receive load, and when they receive load, they will displace. And we mentioned that there is a big difference in response to loading and the amount of displacement. Now, what about the quality of displacement? It is uh, viscoelastic. And in, in this paper, uh, the mucosa uh, response to loading is viscoelastic. It will displace in two phases. The first phase of displacement, as you notice here, 
instantaneous displacement and this displacement is elastic in nature the second phase of displacement upon loading is viscous and more stiffer upon removal of the load there will be an instant recovery of the shape followed by uh, more uh, viscous uh, recovery so generally speaking in mucosa displacement is viscoelastic and it happens in two phases this is important to understand and to remember when discussing the design of the saddle later on here is the uh, periodontal uh, ligament uh, response to loading and it is uh, almost the same as you can see here the uh, curve of the uh, displacement is viscoelastic it's nonlinear stress strain relationship it's time dependent behavior and it's also viscoelastic in nature but you can notice the difference in the amount in uh, microns this is here up to eight microns but we can see uh, uh, an average displacement in microns up to 20 uh, microns we all know that to gain support from the primary abutment we need to place primary supporting element which is against here we have to place the primary supporting element on top of the mucosa to obtain support from mucosa and here it is called the saddle it should be specially designed in order to minimize tissue displacement and bridge the gap in the difference of in displacement between the uh, adjacent primary abutment teeth and the mucosa in order to provide stability and effectiveness for the removal partial tension so let us see together how uh, we are going to manage the soft tissue support first maximum tissue coverage the design of the saddle must cover the maximum available area for support maximum tissue coverage of course with respect to surrounding uh, tissues the function and health of the surrounding tissues must be respected but we have to obtain maximum coverage one of the basic principles it is one of the ba basic principles of uh, saddle design is to cover as large as area as possible so that the pressure falling on any unit area of the edentulous ridge is reduced under vertical and horizontal loading also this will enhance retention and stability contention by the physical forces of adhesion and cohesion with the soft tissue as you can notice here in a we have an underextended uh, saddle uh, while the uh, same removal partial tension properly uh, extended in B you can see we connected the extension of the base to uh, cover the maximum available area just to remind you that the camels can walk easily in the desert because of their white feet their white feet allow the weight of their body to act on a larger surface area of the land second important feature in the design of the saddle is to reduce the received occlusal loads now masticatory load reduction can be achieved by increasing the efficiency of the removable partial denture so that the patient can penetrate the food polus with less effort and subsequently less load being transmitted to the supporting mucosa and that means less displacement this can be affected in both directions anterior posteriorly and buccolingually anterior posteriorly by leaving a tooth off the saddle and buccolingually by using canine premolars instead of more premolars and molars and by using narrow teeth also we can put an example for this uh, 
design just to remind you that using a sharp knife to cut an object requires less effort than using a plant knife. Now, the third and most important design feature for the saddle is the neo functional concept of the saddle. It's a very important design feature for the saddle in the distal extension cases and the most effective way in optimizing support in distal extension cases. The saddle, which is component of uh, removable partial denture, gaining support from the underlying mucosa, just like the wrist on the tooth, will be designed to fit accurately against a functionally displaced mucosa. And we mean by functionally displaced mucosa, the displacement which does not interfere with the blood supply of the bone tissue underlying. So, at the time of glucosal loading, the amount of remaining displacement will be minimum, and the saddle will sink less, therefore less magnitude of torque will be applied on the transfer to the apartment tooth. As we can here notice that the stress-strain curve describing the behavior of the mucosa under loading, we mentioned that we have two phases, phase one and phase two. Now you can see here the first phase where we have an instant displacement on the, of the mucosa. This can be achieved in the mucofunctional uh, impression. Then the amount of remaining displacement will be the stiffer uh, phase, which is viscoelastic. So the denture base will move less in the uh, mucosa. Now in this slide, the mucofunctional impression technique uh, will uh, result, as we mentioned, in the production of modified shape for the saddle. Now here the work flow, which will allow us to produce the uh, modified or altered cast carrying the functional shape of the displaced mucosa uh, in order to minimize the amount of tissue, tissue displacement under loading. This will be explained, uh, I'm sure it's already been explained in the lectures to you. Now let us go back to our design drawing after we designed the first uh, primary supporting element which is the saddle and we mentioned that the saddle should be uh, maximally extended with narrow teeth and the reduced occlusal table to minimize the amount of displacement and it should be designed to fit to the mucofunctional shape of the uh, mucosa at least. So upon loading the amount of uh, remaining displacement will be much less. Now let us move to the second primary apartment uh, available to us which is the uh, premolars. Now we have occlusal surface here so we are going to place an occlusal nest. Now the question now, where to place the occlusal nest, the primary supporting element on the premolars, to place it on the distal occlusal surface or on the mesio occlusal side. Now the first approach, which is the distal occlusal nest, we are applying the basic principle of simplicity while in the uh, mesio occlusal uh, position for the rest we are applying the biomechanical uh, basic principle and we already mentioned in the first video that in bounded saddles we apply simplicity while in the distal extension uh, saddles we apply biomechanics. Now let us see if we 
choose to be simple in the design and not to add any uh, extra components and to bring the occlusal wrist immediately from the guiding plate to sit on a distal occlusal wrist. Now, uh, the main concern in this design that we are creating a class one or first class lever. Now, in such a design, when we place a distal uh, occlusal wrist, the distal extension of the partial denture, the distal extension of the partial denture, will act as a long effort arm for a first class lever with the distal occlusal wrist is the fulcrum of the lever while the resistance arm is short and extends from the fulcrum here in the red color from the fulcrum to the tip of the uh, clasp or direct container uh, and the tooth will uh, be the resistance as in this diagram so upon loading the long effort arm will place a great torque on the resistance which is the abutment tooth here and with cyclic loading uh, there will be torquing and deterioration of the supporting structures around the primary abutment tooth here now to avoid cyclic torquing of the primary abutment tooth during functional loading of the removable partial denture we need to alter the position of the fulcrum so the clasp arm will disengage the abutment tooth instead of engaging the abutment tooth upon function therefore we have to apply a basic design principle which is called mesio occlusal wrist concept the mesial wrist concept is basic design principle applied in distal extension cases based on biomechanics with this mesial wrist acting as the fulcrum we are generating a second class lever the occlusal load will deactivate the lever action instead of activating the lever action you can notice here when you, well, the, if you want to activate the lever action you have to uh, uh, move the uh, uh, effort arm upwards but the occlusal load will move the uh, effort arm downwards and in this direction we are deactivating the lever action and you can notice here the position of the fulcrum is in front of the uh, clasp and all the components distal to the fulcrum will move in downward forward direction and therefore the abutment tooth will be subjected to less torque and less stress this is stress breaking effect requires a design uh, important for the clasp assembly here and uh, among the components of the clasp assembly is the guiding plate and as we mentioned earlier we need a short guiding plane the presence of short guiding plane will allow the guiding plane to disengage the apartment tooth upon closer loading and this will deactivate the torquing effect uh, during function on the apartment tooth we have another advantages to be mentioned for selecting a mesio-occlusal wrist. Mesio-occlusal wrist will cause a mesial tipping upon cyclic loading. Mesial tipping of the apartment tooth will enhance the uh, contact area between the terminal abutment or the primary abutment tooth and the adjacent uh, teeth. So this will uh, prevent food impaction between those teeth while if we placed a distal occlusal wrist the apartment tooth will be tilted in the uh, direction where the 
mist has been placed and this will cause distal uh, chipping of the primary abutment tooth opening the contact point allowing for food impaction which will cause caries and periodontal disease okay now another important advantage for placing in easy occlusal rest is that the alveolar bone utilized for support lies distal to the primary supporting element here we have the primary supporting element and we have all the uh, alveolar bone distal to it will participate in loading and you can compare the amount of alveolar bone gained to participate in support when we use an easy occlusal nest in comparison with the uh, occlusally placed nest at the distal side of the occlusal surface. Also here we have uh, an occlusally view for the uh, so far components placed on the primary abutment tooth we placed a distal guiding plate and a mesio-occlusal nest. The presence of mesio-occlusal nest requires the presence of minor connector which is an additional component which is the main disadvantage of this occlusal nest. But this minor connector has a big and great advantage. This minor connector being placed in the impregnure, lingual impregnure, between the primary abutment tooth and the adjacent mesial tooth will prevent distal and backward movement of the partial dentures upon loading and this will provide pressing and increase the stability of the partial denture by preventing its distal or backward movement horizontally during function. This is a big advantage. Now, as a result of introduce, introducing uh, two primary supporting elements, the fulcrum of rotation resulted around which the rotational movement of the distal extension part will result. And this uh, rotational movement can be discussed in two directions. Tissue direction around this supporting fulcrum. And we already mentioned the design principle for the saddle, which will reduce the amount of tissue work movement. Just to remind you, there should be maximum coverage to minimize the partial unity area. There should be narrow occlusal table in order to reduce the amount of received load and there should be registration of the functional shape of the mucosa uh, under loading. Now, the second uh, movement is the movement away from the tissue upward by the uh, effect of sticky food and the gravity in the upper. Now, this second rotational movement of the distal extension of the denture base, which is going to be away from the tissue, of course, the physical forces of adhesion cohesion between the saddle, the denture base, and the mucosa will provide some resistance, but this is of limited value. So what we need here is a design feature to counteract such rotational movement. So we have to think for uh, a rigid extension of the framework to be extended. Uh, this midline represents the uh, direction of movement of the framework upward by the uh, sticky foods trying to move the distal extension in occlusal direction. We need to have a rigid extension 
of the framework in front of the fulcrum line and to be seated on a specially prepared hard surface which is called the rest seat as we know to prevent this rigid extension to move downward and by that by preventing the uh, rigid extension in the front of the fulcrum line by preventing this component from moving downward you are preventing the uh, distal extension part of the framework from moving upward okay and this movement away from the tissue or upward movement in other words we are enhancing the retention of the distal extension by preventing its movement away from the tissue but the component which provided this quality of the framework is not a retainer it is a wrist and so we call it indirect retainer as it is look its location can uh, be uh, in the front of the fulcrum line and it will affect the distal extension uh, by preventing its movement away from the tissue now the location of this component can be anywhere in the front of the fulcrum line we have remaining available teeth here we have six anterior teeth in the front of the primary abutment teeth where the fulcrums of the uh, rotational movement now any rigid component placed in the front of this support fulcrum will provide us with indirect retention and prevent the distal extension from moving away from the tissue now the further forward the indirect retainer which is as we just mentioned will be a rest the more efficient it will be ideally the central incisors here we have the fulcrum of rotation the support fulcrum if we established a perpendicular bisector on it it will uh, point out to us the most appropriate location for the indirect retainer from the biomechanical point of view as we have here a long uh, resistance arm but those two centrals are small they are too small and not strong enough to support the indirect retention and they have steep inclination and therefore cannot be safely prepared the preparation on this steep inclination on this small teeth can uh, uh, immediately uh, get you in, in, into dentine so here we have alternative options to uh, be used as indirect retainers we can use the nearest horizontal surface as a location for the indirect retainer bilaterally to compensate for the compromise in distance so here we can choose the mesio-occlusal uh, location of the first premolar on the right and on the left those two indirect retainers can compensate for the uh, compromise and distance and we can use also a major connector major connector it, it is a rigid extension from the framework it can be placed on the uh, single arm of the all anterior teeth and the load of the indirect retention can be uh, applied on all the uh, anterior teeth so we, uh, we can uh, load them safely as you can notice here we uh, have uh, a continuous uh, dental bar in addition to the lingual bar this is the action of this lingual bar as, as indirect retainer uh, to the distal extension cases here we have a mandibular and distal extension removable partial denture the movement away from the tissue the movement away from the tissue 
of the distal extension base is effectively controlled by the indirect retainer placed on the uh, mesial, mesoincisal edge of the canine. This will prevent the uh, um, movement away from the tissue of the distal extension saddle. Now, we can uh, gain indirect retention from a conventional wrist placed on a wrist seat, as we can see here. We can use a major connector in front of the fulcrum. It will help and it will provide us with uh, effective indirect retention. The presence of any modification area in the front of the support fulcrum can act as indirect retainer also. So the uh, spread of design has been completed. So we can move now to the second or third component, which is the connectors to connect all the components together. We have the major and minor connector. Here we draw the uh, selected major connector, which is the lingual bar in this case and you can notice here we have the upper borders of the lingual bar we have to indicate to the lab technician the required amount of distance between the upper border of the lingual bar and the free gingival margin this is an occlusal view and this is in profile view the distance should be minimum of a three millimeter between the free gingival margin and the upper border of the lingual bar. Now the lingual bar must be rigid. It is its shape is half pear shape, and its height should be a minimum of four millimeters. So the depth, the functional depth of the floor of the mouth, should be examined at the beginning of. Uh, or at the stage of uh, examination of the patient and we have to measure the depth of the uh, functional floor of the mouth uh, it should be minimum of seven millimeters in order to choose the uh, lingual bar as major connector now the minor connectors will connect the components to the major connector and here we have to uncover the mucosa in order to facilitate the oral hygiene and avoid compression, as we mentioned earlier, the biological width of the remaining teeth. The, the distance between each two minor connectors should be a minimum of five millimeters in order to allow for self-cleansing action less than uh, five or four millimeters will uh, cause food collection and it will be difficult to clean them the cross-sectional area of the lingual bar must be uh, emphasized to the lab technician it is important now after we uh, uh, choose the major and minor connectors we can move now to add the retention the direct retainers to the primary abutment teeth now the components so far placed on the primary abutment teeth on both sides the, the first the second premolars right and left the Guiding plate, as we mentioned, should be shown two to three millimeters, and the occlusal wrist placed on the mesio occlusal aspect with its minor connector connecting it to the major connector. Now, the direct retainer of choice in this case is the gingivally approaching clasp. And it is not possible here to have a 15 millimeter length for occlusally approaching, while the gingivally approaching clasp can be extended in the sulcus uh, 
so we can achieve uh, 15 millimeter length for the retentive clasp arm in order to be flexible enough. Now, in order to achieve uh, this strength breaking effect, we mentioned that the guiding plate should be short, two to three millimeters. Okay. Now here we can see the occlusal view. Before that, we can see that when when we apply occlusal load, there will be disengagement of the primary abutment tooth, and the uh, rotational movement of the framework around the fulcrum of support which passes uh, through the mesio-occlusal wrist will cause downward forward movement of any distal component to it, including the clasp tip. And when the clasp tip moves in downward and forward movement, it, it's going to disengage the abutment tooth, and so there will be no torque during function and this is the occlusal view of the clasp assembly. The proximal plate, in conjunction with the minor connector of the mesially placed, placed wrist, will provide the reciprocation. Now, we have the retentive clasp arm, we have the occlusal wrist, we have the proximal plate. Now, where is the reciprocation? Now, the minor connector for the loosely uh, placed wrist, the mesial side, and the uh, proximal plate will provide reciprocation against the uh, retentive clasp arm. It's important that we have enough depth for the sulcus in order to place the origin of the eye bar a minimum of five millimeter away from the finger gingival margin to avoid impingement of the uh, biological width of the apartment tooth. So here we have mesially placed occlusal wrist. We take the letter R from the wrist, and we have a distal proximal plate, letter P, and we have gingivally approaching eye bar clasp, and these letters will be assembled together in order to use the term RPI system. It is very important to be familiar with this uh, clasping system. This clasping system is exclusively used in distal extension cases when we have the terminal abutments premolars when we have the first or second premolar as the terminal abutment in distal extension cases, we automatically use the RPI system. As we mentioned, it has a uh, strength breaking effect design, uh, and this will uh, be in favor of the uh, health of the terminal abutment. Now we can add here to our drawing the selected retentive clasp arm. This is the direction uh, of the eye bar in the drawing. It originates from the it originates from the mesh, goes in the sulcus in order to gain length, and comes to attach or in touch with the uh, primary abutment tooth in the mid buckle location. Now, it's important to mention the fact that we can have a wrist without a clasp, but we never have a clasp without a wrist. Here we have a wrist without a clasp, it's an indirect retainer. Here we have a wrist, and we can have a clasp added to it to complete the clasp assembly, but we cannot replace any clasp without a wrist. Now, placing a clasp here will create to us what is called clasp axis. 
it should be i clasp axis anyhow the clasp axis is very close to the support fulcrum because and it follows the uh, support fulcrum because as we mentioned there will be uh, no class without a wrist now uh, when we have uh, movement away from the tissue by the effect of sticky food the rotation will be around the clasp axis okay which is very close to the support axis and slightly distal to it because we placed the primary supporting element on the meso occlusal uh, location of the primary abutment tooth so the tip of the clasp is distal to it so always the clasp axis becomes uh, very close to the support fulcrum and when the uh, distal extension moves away from the tissue it will rotate around the clasp axis because the first component to resist this movement will be the tips of the uh, direct retainers the component which should prevent this movement away from the tissue of course as you know as we mentioned is the indirect retainers placed on the meso occlusal surface of the premolars <coughs> Here we uh, uh, need to indicate two important design features should be clear on the drawing which are the tissue stops and the finish lines. Those very important components must be uh, uh, added to the drawing and clearly uh, mentioned in the instructions to the laboratory technician as you notice here the tissue stops in the area of first premolar the area of first molar these tissue stops mainly used in distal extension cases and in long bounded saddles And we have here uh, the finish line where the metal stops and starts the acrylic part. Now, the tissue stops, they are metallic offsets placed on the internal surface of the meshwork in the distal extension cases to provide adequate space for the acrylic denture base underneath the framework here we have the framework spaced from the cast but in this point the uh, tissue stops touching the cast touching the alveolar edge of the cast so when we pack the acrylic resin the acrylic uh, will not be able to move the mesh and it will uh, uh, enter in those openings and the space here preserved by the uh, tissue stop will be filled with the acrylic and here we can notice the finish line here the polished metal finished and then the acrylic will start the finish lines can be external and internal the external from the polished surface aspect and the internal from the fitting surface aspect those finish lines are actually a localized thickening of the metal base where acrylic part starts they have very important advantages they, crea they, they co create a precise and definite limit of the acrylic part and they provide smooth transition from the acrylic to metal 
in a form of putt joint, joint at right angle between the two components. So internal and external finish lines indicated on the drawing. This is very important. And here we have completed the drawing. Hopefully in a second uh, video I'm going to uh, explain the drawing in more details. Now we need to fill the table describing the design components. Here the major connector indicated clearly. And we have here the primary abutment tooth starting with uh, first primary abutment tooth clockwise the lower left five we have a distal proximal plate and we can indicate here if you wish the height of the guiding plane two to three millimeters we are going to place mesial occlusal wrist and the abbreviations here D for distal M for mesial O for occlusal now we cannot use abbreviations uh, in a double way or double meaning. So when we here uh, indicate the uh, retention location, the mid buckle should be uh, written in this way. So we have a mid buckle uh, location for the undercut, the amount of undercut uh, maximum of 0 0.25 for the uh, I bar. The class type here selected is the RPI system and as we mentioned, the reciprocation will be from the lingual aspect from the minor connector of the closely placed wrist and the proximal plate. Now the uh, first three molars, as you remember, we used them uh, as a location for our indirect retention, so we placed the occlusal wrist on them and they do not participate in uh, the retention or guidance. Uh, the second primary abutment tooth is the lower right five, and we also we have a distal proximally plate and mesio occlusally placed uh, wrist. We have a mid buccal retention of maximum of 0 0.25 uh, millimeter. Uh, the class type is the RPI system and we provide the reciprocation from the lingual uh, aspect by the minor connector of the eye bar and the plate. Tissue stops at the area of lower left six and lower right six. This is very important because if the, page, if the technician did not provide the framework with tissue stops, uh, we expect to have big problem uh, during packing of acrylic resin. The finish line must be indicated. They are distal to both primary abutment teeth, lower left five and lower left and lower right five. Here we have a similar case in the upper bilateral distal extension. Starting with the outline, we have the classification in class one, primary abutment teeth, upper right five, upper left five, the second premolars. Uh, on them we have the guiding planes, uh, guiding plane one and guiding plane two. They will provide us with the anterior posterior tilt, which is most probably going to be an anterior tilt because we have uh, unmodified class one. Then we place the primary supporting elements. Now the mucosa here uh, 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 is less uh, problematic in comparison with the lower because we here we have wider area available for support as we are going to mention while uh, talking about the connector. Now uh, we have the primary apartment uh, teeth. We we uh, placed the primary uh, supporting elements on them, which is the mesial occlusal wrist on both sides, and with the distal proximal or guiding plates. 
Now this will create a fulcrum, which is support fulcrum, the movement away from the tissue, maybe by the effect of gravity or sticky food, will be resisted by the indirect retainers. The indirect uh, retainers placed on the horizontal surface of the uh, first premolars, uh, like the lower. Now, as the spread of design completed, we uh, selected the uh, major connector, which is broad palatal strap. It will provide us with good support for the distal extension because we have attached the mucosa in this area and wide area. Then the minor connectors connected the uh, components to the major connector and you can notice the spaces between the minor connectors minimum of five millimeters and the margins of the major connector are uh, a minimum of six to eight millimeters away from the marginal gingiva of the remaining teeth to avoid impingement of the uh, biological width of these teeth. Now we selected the uh, direct retainers. We placed uh, gingival approaching clasp on the uh, primary abutments and this created the clasp axis. The clasp axis very close and distal to the support fulcrum. And if you notice here, I'm saying support fulcrum, it is more important than the clasp axis. The clasp axis will be uh, very close to the support fulcrum and it is uh, uh, following the support fulcrum as we mentioned that we have we may have rest without a clasp but we cannot have a clasp without a rest in the design so here uh, the movement away from the tissue of the distal extension cases will be around the clasp axis because the clasp tips will be the first component to resist this movement now the uh, component which will prevent this movement uh, uh, is the direct retention component on both sides and the presence of two in indirect retainers will compensate for the compromise in distance. Ideally, the two centrals here will provide the ideal location for the indirect retention, but as we mentioned, uh, the central the central incisors might be labially inclined, uh, uh, and we have the uh, slope here difficult to place or to prefer rest seats on them. And we have here the anterior palate, an area quite frequently visited by the tongue. So the presence of a component here, the minor connector here, might cause a discomfort to the patient. So we move to the first horizontal surface available, which is the mesio-occlusal uh, surface of the first premolars to place our indirect retention. Then we indicated the location of the tissue stops, as we have distal extension cases, and we also uh, located the area of external and internal lines, finish lines. So. Uh, in the coming slides, we are going to discuss the class two and more uh, information about drawing the design. See you soon and have a good time.